There's any other place we could spend the night? I have no idea. She's gonna have to leave. Damn. All right. Well, I mean, I guess I can appreciate that we can't spend the night on a bus. Somewhere to spend the night. Okay, so find shelter for Come the on, night. Guys, we've got to hurry. So we, so all we know is that Todd is high and very likely is going to put out some sort of. I mean, I gotta believe that he's gonna send something to look for us. Just what else is he doing tonight? So we gotta think this through for a second. If you are in this position, the most important thing that you can find for yourself is like safety and security. I I'm not super worried about how comfortable this is gonna be. I don't really know our options. It looks like we have, okay, so we have a motel available. The Eastern Motel. Comfortable, but not discreet, and will need money. I don't have money, and I don't really know how to get money right now, and I have a hard time believing that an android coming into a motel asking for a room and money is going to go over well. That seems a little bit too conspicuous, if you ask me. John's Coffee won't open before morning, which suggests to me that maybe we'd have to break in? Mega washer, open 24-7, can't stay. Also seems like if we were to go to a laundromat that we could easily be found, so that doesn't seem particularly useful. Some sort of abandoned house. Un uncomfortable, but safe. But don't know how to get in. Also, how do we know there's not other people in there? Open 24-7 but can't sleep here. Ask for help at a pharmacy. I just feel like, again, we look way too shady. An android with a little girl when all that's in the news right now is deviant. I don't, that just doesn't seem safe. And a parking lot. Very uncomfortable but discreet. I like... I like... Very uncomfortable, but discreet. Come on, Alice. Like, comfort is not of utmost priority right now. Survival is. Alice, what do you... I mean... What are you doing? I know you're cold, Alice. Alice, you're freezing cold. I'm okay. I'm not so cold. You look lost. We have nowhere to go. Who are you? I know someone who can help you. What are we doing? What, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? But that's on the other side of town. We need a place for tonight.
Come on, Alice. Private property or trespassers will be prosecuted. Sleep in abandoned car. It's dry. Yeah, I don't see I just I don't feel comfortable going into that house because that seems like the logical spot. Put a generator here. Let's check the car to make sure nobody's in it. Doesn't look like it's running. Nobody in it looks there. It's abandoned. I just don't oh man, I don't trust that. I really don't. Alice is struggling, so. I don't have a key. I guess we're gonna bash the windshield. Or we're gonna bash the side window. We're just gonna let some cold Stand air back, in. Alice. We don't have the strength to be able to open that the normal way. We also just made a lot of noise doing that. dry inside and nobody will find us here i don't want to sleep in there can't we find a better place i'm sorry alice no i totally understand but your comfort is going to be with me and it's going to be safety i got to look out for you you, you I, we have to do this i can't put you at We're risk better off staying alice the important thing is for us to be safe and it's just for tonight. Nope. I don't have to worry about warm Alice up. All right. Put this old ass raggedy jacket on you. Why didn't he ever love me? Why was he always so upset with me? All I wanted was a life like other girls. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I wasn't good enough. That's why he was always so angry. I just wanted us to be a family. I just wanted him to love me. Why can we just be happy? I don't know, Alice. You'll never leave me, right? I promise you'll never go. Oh. All right, I'm not timed on this. Um. There's development right there. That's develop. That's the development. I'm going to pause this just in case. So that's the development right there of a child. So she has internalized all of this as being her fault, which is exactly what we would expect. She's going to see this in an egocentric way. She's going to use inductive reasoning in order to make sense of this. And so all the pain, Todd's anger, him not loving her. These are all the types of questions a child like that is going to ask themselves because they don't have other context. Now, we, I certainly, in this case, there's generally this desire to reassure her and to jump in and say, no, 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 honey, no, that's not true. But to her, it is. To her, it is. And so before we try to talk her out of that mindset, we have to empathize with her. We want to hear that. I, un I, I know that's how it feels, honey. That makes a lot of sense. He, he has been really angry. It's easy to think that it's your fault. And then we say, but you know what? It isn't. 
Sometimes people are really unhappy and they blame other people. And your dad blamed you. And that's not fair because it's not your fault. It's it's your dad's fault or it's it's work's fault. There's a lot of other stuff and your dad just doesn't know how to how to he doesn't know how to communicate that effectively and he hurts you and that's not okay. It's not okay that he does that. But I'm here to listen to that and to remind you that that is absolutely not your fault. If you were unlovable, I wouldn't be here taking care of you. I'm here taking care of you because you matter. Now, the trick here... I'm going to actually tell her that I will be here for her. As much as it actually might, as may, as it, as much as it may seem intuitive for us to say, I can't promise that, Alice. She needs comfort right now. She needs trust in this moment. I can tell her I'm not leaving right now. I don't intend to bail on her. But I gotta say to her what's gonna get us through this night. If I say I can't promise that, and Alice gets angry and says she's gonna leave and tries to storm out of the car and makes a big scene that puts us both in danger, and I can't afford that. So I have to tell her I promise. Like I, I will, I will be here. I'm here for you right now, and I will be, in a way that Todd has not been. I promise. Will we be together forever? Forever. is not old enough to fully understand the context and the nuance of that question she just asked. Alice is basically asking me, am I reliable? Am I here for you? I have to say yes there. I have to think like the adult. I have to promise her that. Say, yes, I'm here. It draws her in, right? She comes toward me. She's here. She's quiet. She's safe. She's comfortable. She will come to understand that that question is not realistic later on. But for right now, that's, that is what Alice needs for reassurance. That's what we, we need that for her because we are in a dangerous situation. And if you're ever bringing a child through a dangerous situation like this, in part because you have to do it, your entire goal is to keep that child calm and reassured, not to help them understand the situation because her brain is not complex enough to understand that. You keep it very simple. Alice shared what's going on for her. We can we listened. And then she says, I can't rely on him. Can I rely on you? And right now the answer is absolutely yes. If we can't keep that promise, couldn't it lead to or exacerbate trust issues? It could, but we need her alive. Right now, the what if is not worth it. So we, in, we're in a crisis situation right now. We're trying to find a place to stay after we ran away from our human. And we have to keep ourselves alive. We have to keep ourselves safe. And in those moments, we, again, we have to deal with known variables. Right now, what I know we have is a child that needs reassurance so that she's willing to follow me, to listen to my directives, and to trust that I'm going to keep her safe. I can't go down the land of what ifs of, well, what happens if in two years I get decommissioned or my battery runs out and then Alice has trust issues because I told her that I'd promise we'd be there forever. I have to trust that development's going to take over at some point in her life, and she's going to come to understand why I had to say that to her in that moment. But I can't use that as a variable through which to make this decision in the here and now. No way. We get too sucked into 
the future sometimes when we're in crisis situations. And like I said last night, in a crisis situation, you work with known variables in the present. That's what gets you through it. So that's why we got to do that that way, in my opinion. Oh, only 25% of people stay in the car, huh? Interesting. Cool. Let's see what's next. Ominous. Oh my god. Self-diagnostic assessment. Engage. Audio processor. Corrupted audio data. Damaged. Processing. Impaired vision. Corrupted mind palace. Oh, we were not treated well, were we? All systems in low power mode defective. Left and right leg components missing, unable to stand. Replace legs. I mean, it looks like we've been sent to some kind of junkyard. Processing data, right leg component, status functional, compatible. Thank God we can't feel pain. So are these my legs or are these other legs? This is nuts. Looks like another android. AC 900 compatible functional. junk oh my god i see other lights too which suggests i'm probably not the only android that's aware of what's happening here holy shit oh my god if i'm an android that's in this situation i want my battery to run out So we can be free. Find Jericho. Find Jericho. Find Jericho. Oh my god. 
Come on, Marcus. Keep pushing, buddy. Keep pushing. Where are you going? Uh, J Jericho. That is where I'm going. J Jericho. I hope you know about it, too. Like at least turn folks off before we throw them in here? Holy shit! Low energy, incompatible PV600. You need some help? talk about it later optical unit blue iris functional hello i'm an ak700 android i was designed to serve you what can i do for you you can give me your eye hello i'm an ak700 android i'm sorry man i'm sorry ak700 my program has detected an anomaly please contact the nearest cyberlife maintenance center processor incompatible audio processor functional all right let's get that What a moment that is. I just, I have chills. Oh my God. Ethereum <laughs> pump regulator. All right, let's get it. I to argue who am I to argue I, I, that is not my call to make man that guy that guy saying end it now this is miserable I can't say I blame him he's resigned it I know how to turn him off I'm doing it he gets to make that call for himself I am not gonna play God on this that guy if that guy feels like that's the most merciful way out he gets to be out on his own terms 
we're ending it right there. Hundred times out of a hundred, I'm making that. I'm I'm making that choice. Respect that. Ethereum pump regulator incompatible. Oh, don't you do this to me, game. Don't you do this to me. Don't you put me in a position of having to choose my life over the life of another android. Oh, thank God. Please be a guy who's not alive. God, we were built to be modular. Climb the slope. Oh my goodness. You can take that out? Okie dokie. So then that tells me that that light there is there for humans. So that humans know what's happening with the android. 
Because if you can just pop that out, you aren't going to do that unless you're deviant. But why would you leave that in once you're deviant? How would anybody know the difference? Uh, 41% of folks killed the guy who asked to be killed. And 30% of people refused to kill for the pump. Wow. I mean, you could always come back and kill her. Jeez. Um, all right. So this is... For whatever intents and purposes you want to have, I think this is probably about as close to a traumatic experience as a like as an android could have. Like... He literally wakes up surrounded by people that have been cast aside, destroyed but not decommissioned, left to just exist in this junkyard pile. Oh my God. And Marcus has already made the decision to go deviant at this point. So he is going to see this Relative to humans. Androids certainly didn't do this unless they were told by humans to do it. So if... I mean, this this ostensibly would be an impetus for Marcus to be like, oh, this shit's got to change. You know, he says, I am Marcus. He's found identity in that name. He's rebuilt himself. He, I mean, there's like a metaphor here of like Phoenix rising from the ashes, I guess. Oh, boy. Now, as far as the decision of, you know, this, the, the person that says, please kill me. I just want to die. I don't blame him. And like I said, I would do that. I would do that every time. I believe in death with dignity. I have every reason to believe that android is of sound mind and body to make that decision. And there, maybe there's a anti-suicide protocol built into the android, so I'm doing him a huge favor by 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 ending his life. That's I could go to sleep at night knowing I did that. The one that said, "Please let me live," I don't want to die. I respect that too. Neither one of those two people is is better or worse than the other. They're both important. They their convictions each matter. That is each person making a choice about how they want this time to go forward or not go forward in the case of the guy that said, kill me. So both of them are well within their right to make that decision. And I wanted to respect each. Now me taking the eye, it, it, it has another one. I, I don't, I mean, that one's a little bit more gray and ambiguous, but. That's intense, man. What an intense moment. And I am Marcus. I, you know, if we want to look at that as some form of self-actualization where he has decided I'm Marcus. I mean, I guess he could change his name. He could say something else. But like, I am Marcus is very much a what a deviant would say. Like, I have figured out who I am. And I'm now going to... Now I want to figure out what what is it, what is it that I believe? What is it that matters to me? And this, if we look at, so, okay, so I want to break this down into a developmental context. Because if we look at this as Marcus's development of self started the moment he went deviant at Carl's house. Then, theoretically, what this means is that Marcus doesn't really have a foundation for what his values are as an individual and what matters to him. So this experience in the graveyard is a formative experience for him. Even though he looks like an adult, it's a formative experience. It is something that he is forever going to remember. 
It carries a significant amount of weight and is now something that he's going to wrap conviction and purpose around because of how formative it is. We don't know if he remembers Carl. Even if he does, we don't know if he had any of his own ideas out like while he was with Carl or if it was just a manifestation of Carl. So really, Marcus's self-actualization didn't end here. It starts here. I'm going to figure out who I am from this point. What is my purpose now? What do I want to do? How do I want to live? And we, I think it's important for us to see that in context because I'll be curious to see what sort of decisions Marcus makes going forward relative to this formative experience. A formative experience, by the way, that basically says humans are awful for putting us in this position and we are helpless against it to an extent. This would be like having an adverse childhood experience or a trauma that happened for a person that they then build around. Again, he probably remembers. It's so here's the thing, right? Like he probably remembers everything that happened with Carl. He probably remembers Leo. He remembers he's an android. He remembers all of these things. I'm not I'm not faulting his memory. What I'm saying is that those memories were under a different context. Those memories were under a context of him being within protocol where he was following instructions. He was doing as Carl said. He was it, it's all just straight up what happened, right? But it's not going to be how he felt. It's not going to have any emotional context around it per se, unless he just start, he starts deriving it from those memories, but he's going to be making that emotional experience. Now he's not going to be drawing upon an emotional experience he had then. And then is Marcus going to make a distinction between those events as events that happened because he was told what to do, but weren't actually autonomous on his behalf. And then see the moment that he broke through with Leo and made the decision to stay put as a first act of autonomy, and then this climbing out of the graveyard and saying that he's Marcus as acts of autonomy, right? Like now he's in a different mental context, so to speak, where he is autonomous and he's drawing upon his own emotional experience. So I, I think that's a very important distinction to make. I don't know for certain that's what's going on, but that would be my hypothesis is that he's going to be looking at these two formative experiences post-deviation protocol as opposed to what happened before. Because what happened before was not autonomous on his behalf. And we'll see. I, I have no idea whether I'm right or not or whether it'll actually matter. But that's, you know, I have to think developmentally as it relates to this stuff. But formative experiences are powerful. I'd like to use this as an opportunity before I go to the next section to say to all of you that are here with me on Twitch right now, whether you're live, lurking, or watching the VOD, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you spending time with me and that you will come out here late at night to watch me live. It means a lot. If you are watching me on YouTube, thank you so much for watching my VODs. I hope you enjoy these. I want to say hello to you, that I appreciate you all the same, and that I hope by now you've liked and subscribed to my channel. The best way for anybody to support this stream is to share it with other folks. If you're on YouTube, please comment. I would love seeing the comments. I like to respond to them when I can. And if you could take a second to follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, you'll also get the psychological illustrations there as well. But thank you all for being here. I appreciate you immensely. Find Amanda. Where the hell are we? This doesn't look like Detroit. We're in the Detroit Botanical Gardens. Find a man. Panda is over here, it seems.
I assume this is Amanda. Hello, Amanda. Connor, it's good to see you. Congratulations, Connor. Finding that deviant was far from easy. And the way you interrogated it was very clever. You've been remarkably efficient, Connor. Thank you, Amanda. We've asked the DPD to transfer it to us for further study. It may teach us something about what happened. The interrogation seemed... challenging. What did you think of the Deviant? It simulated human emotion, fear in particular, in a very convincing way. It seemed completely overwhelmed by them and behaved irrationally. This Lieutenant Anderson has been officially assigned to the Deviancy case. What do you make of him? I find him unpleasant and unprofessional. He seems to have an addictive personality, has a lack of respect for procedure, and despises androids, which makes our relationship difficult. Unfortunately, we have no choice but to work with him. What do you think is the best approach? I will adapt to his personality. It is in the best interest of the investigation that I avoid conflict and try to accommodate his psychology. More and more androids show signs of deviancy. There are millions in circulation. If they become unstable, the consequences will be disastrous. You're the most advanced prototype Cyberlife has ever created. If anyone can figure out what's happening, it's you. You can count on me, Amanda. Hurry, Connor. There's little time. I don't know who that is. I know nothing about her. So, when you don't know context, a good recommendation interactionally is to go with what would be the broad strokes expectation that you could re reasonably assume that a person has of you. So in this moment, my goal was to respond to her the way that I could reasonably expect a person to see a android that is designed to do what Connor does. So Connor would see Hank as annoying. He would profile. He would talk about the android as being a simulation. And it seems that when I did that, she was cool. When I said adapt to him... I don't have a read on why she didn't like that. And so I'm just, I don't know if that's going to be an interaction we continue to have with her or if that was a one-off. If it's a one-off, I'm just going to let it go. But if there are future interactions with her, I'm going to pay attention. But again, rule of thumb would be act in the way that a person could reasonably expect you to until you learn more about that person, where they come from, and what their context is. Because if I adapt, so, okay, so let's, let's think about this for a second. If I adapt to be able to work with Hank, I 
Does that then mean that that assists Hank in figuring out why Deviance is happening? Because now we're working together. And does that make this Amanda person angry because she doesn't want Deviance to be found out and understood? Like, I don't know if she works on behalf of Cyberlife. I have no idea what her what she what her gig is. Or is she disappointed by that answer? Because maybe that's me sounding somewhat deviant like. She she had an air of skepticism about me. But I also don't know how me saying adaptation is 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 bad. Like I it just it's very interesting. Side note. I don't particularly enjoy that this game shows you the effect that you have on a person. I don't like that the game showed us that Amanda didn't like my answer to that. I want to learn that through the way she adapts in responding to me, through the questions she asks me. I don't want that spoon-fed to me. That's a conversation for a different day. We are now at the department at the Detroit Police Department. So let's see what let's see what's happening here. I, I don't have much more to say about Amanda. I, I, that was a very odd interaction. Look for Lieutenant Anderson. Got it. Find Hank. Don't cross the line. What's going on over here? Yeah, you might You're being shot. Tensions just, in the Arctic have reached a new level. Yeah. A Russian carrier and an American patrol boat reported to have clashed last night. Several warning shots were exchanged, apparently with no damage or casualties to either side. The Minister for Defense, Dennis Riggs, has spoken of go. intolerable provocation that cannot go unanswered. The countries in the region, particularly Sweden and Should Canada, have called for military forces to withdraw and an international conference to be held. So far, there has been no response from either Moscow or Washington. We'll keep you informed minute by minute as the situation develops. To, all right, so I don't know what's going on with these folks, but honor. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Enlist today in the police department. <laughs> Okie dokie. Let's see. Hello. Can I help you? Okay. I'm here to see Lieutenant Anderson. Do you have authorization? Yes. Lieutenant Anderson hasn't arrived yet, but you can wait at his desk. Okie dokie. Captain Anderson's desk. Where would that be? Or Lieutenant Anderson's desk. Where would that be? I'm guessing Hank would have a somewhat disheveled desk ask about desk yeah where is it i'm looking for lieutenant anderson's desk it's that desk right there thank you pm 700 i appreciate that immensely Ooh. Famous Detroit painter dies. Carl Manfred, one of Detroit's brightest you, lights. You come with me? UN warns of World War III. President Warren at 33% approval. Jeez. Reports of famous artist Carl Manfred's death have been confirmed. The coroner described a fatal cardiac event induced by a stressful domestic situation. Manfred's son, Leo, has asked the media to respect his family's privacy at this difficult time. 
Carl Manfred rose to fame in the 2020s as a figurehead of neo symbolism with powerful and dark works on the full in the mold of Francis Bacon. Proliferate years followed until a dark period marked by alcohol and drugs, but the artist had apparently returned to work in recent months. The governor of Detroit expressed her condolences to the family on behalf of the city, describing Manfred as one of Detroit's brightest lights. A collection of Manfred's paintings will be auctioned by his estate in the coming weeks. So Carl had his own run-in with addiction. I wonder, as a hypothesis, if that coincided with Carl having a child. Because if Carl is a prolific artist and devotes a significant amount of his time and energy to his work as he's growing and he had a child, a child puts the brakes on that. You all of a sudden can't dump your full attention into your work anymore. You have a child to take care of. And I wonder if Leo could feel a bit of resentment from his father as a result of that, both as he was growing up and as he went into his teens, and if Carl started using alcohol to escape the tension of that. Perhaps thinking that he wished he could be a good dad, but couldn't find it in him because his passion was elsewhere. Again, I have no idea if this is true, but I find it very interesting they talk about a dark period marked by alcohol and drugs. And he only recently returned. We see these types of things happen often with high achieving folks when they have children. I feel like that says a lot about Leo. He has the opportunity for revenge by ruining his reputation with no repercussions, but he asked for privacy instead. Do you think that speaks to how he genuinely feels about Carl or is that a little expected? My guess is that that's expected. Uh, and I don't know why he would have any incentive to ruin his, ruin his father's reputation because Leo needs his father to have valuable paintings so he can get money for the paintings so that he can fuel his drug addiction would be my guess. So it goes against his own self-interest to smash his father's reputation. And that, by the way, is what addiction does to folks because if he needs drugs and he needs money for those drugs... That's going to take precedent even over trying to tarnish his father's reputation post-death so that he can feel better about himself. I have no idea, but that would be my guess. Uh, Dwayne, thank you so much for the raid, friend. I uh, appreciate it very much. Those of you coming along with Dwayne, this is a spoiler-free run of Detroit. So please, please, please do not post any spoilers in chat. You will be kicked out. Uh, also, please don't talk about any alternative endings or pathways we're focusing on the one that's here i am dr mick i'm a licensed therapist and i use games to illustrate psychological concepts if that sounds interesting to you feel free to stick around and hang out i could be shelves I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you but the painting's going into auction detroit today ivanov says niet Russian president responds to Warren's warning. CyberLife, world's first trillion dollar company. Global population reaches 10 billion. Oh my God. Following President Warren's demand that all Russian troops withdraw from the Arctic immediately, President Ivanov of Russia has issued a response. Ivanov branded Warren's comments as megaphone diplomacy and said U.S. saber rattling is the number one threat to stability in the region. The Kremlin produced a detailed statement outlining Russia's claim to the territory, and Ivanov said he would remind President Warren that, quote, the United States is subject to UN conventions like everybody else. The conflict shows no signs of abating. Good old Russia-US infighting. All right, let's check out Hank's desk. Lieutenant Anderson. Desk located. Look for Anderson. Excuse me. Do you know what time Lieutenant Anderson usually arrives? Depends on where he was the night before. If we're lucky, we'll see him before noon. Thanks. Oh. Uh, interesting reputation to have. I 
don't want to sit here. I want to explore the new office. I don't want to sit down. I want to look at I want to look at Hank's desk. I want to understand Hank better. Okay. Knights of Black Death. Knights of the Black Death. All right. Hank listens to metal. I can appreciate that. Clues to analyze. Ooh, good. This is ooh, this is what I like. Okay. Coffee cup. Cold coffee traces of caffeine. Japanese maple, Asian shishigashira shohin. Oh my god. I'm so sorry that I butchered that. Donuts. Calories, 452. Saturated fatty acids, 13 grams. Cholesterol, 19 milligrams. Carbohydrates, 50, 51 grams. Hey, I love me some donuts. Simply the best donuts. Got two boxes. My man. Anti-Android slogans. Use your brain, not your Android. Android free space. I don't take it. If I wanted to be ignored, I'd talk to my ex-wife. We don't bleed the same color. How's my driving? Call 1555. I don't care. No more androids. If you're not a bartender, then go away. If you have a complaint, please go to hell. Happy people make me sick. I'm not grumpy. I just don't like you. Warning to avoid injury. Don't tell me how to do my job. Oh, he's fun. He roots for the Detroit Pistons. Detroit dismantle a network of red ice dealers. More than 50 arrests throughout the country. Detroit's finest has dealt a massive blow to the city's growing red ice e epidemic. With a number of high-profile dealers and suppliers now behind bars and narcotics seized with a street value of $500,000. Detective Hank Anderson, a young but hugely talented detective, is said to have been instrumental in the operation, which took months of planning. The DA described the work of Detective Anderson and his colleagues as, quote, model investigative police work. Detective Anderson promoted to the rank of lieutenant, becoming the youngest lieutenant on the Detroit police force. Lieutenant Hank Anderson was among the most decorated detectives in DPD's recent history, securing a number of high-profile arrests and serving as an integral member of the force. Captain Fowler said the promotion was long overdue, describing Anderson as among the most talented police I've ever worked with. The new lieutenant is expected to rise quickly through the ranks of the department and is already being tipped as a future commissioner. New record seizure of red ice in Detroit. Nearly a ton of red ice discovered in the hold of a boat after a long investigation conducted by Lieutenant Anderson of the Detroit Police Force. Damn, Hank's got it out for red ice, huh? It's interesting, though. I wonder if Hank being as good at his job as he is perhaps led to people having unrealistic expectations of him. And Hank's way of asserting autonomy against that is to become a little bit of a slob. Also, people who are gifted, in this case, you know, we might reasonably assume that Hank is gifted, can sometimes be tortured by that. In the sense that, like, you, your brain just doesn't shut off. People ask a lot of you. There's a lot of internal and external pressure on you. Sometimes you'll find that people who are gifted will turn to things like alcohol in order to kind of numb that, turn it off. And again, to find some level of control and autonomy and forcing again, forcing oneself against that. That's one hypothesis I have. I don't know that that's the case, but it also, I mean, it could just be that Hank had a, had a bad experience or something like that. But you see things like that happen in folks that are really good at what they do sometimes. Okay. Um, hairs, canine hairs, St. Bernard dog. Oh my God. I freaking love St. Bernard's, man. 
Tank, all, Tank just scored a few more points with me after his board took some away. Matches, Origins, Jimmy's Bar, Wood Phosphorus. Red Ice Task Force 2027, multi-department unit responsible for the Red Ice Network dismantle of 2028. Good cop, real police, asshole, nice girl, not seen since 2019, owes me 50 bucks. A little piece of tissue here. I mean, Hank, do you not have a garbage can to, like, throw some shit away in? Oh, what's up, buddy? It's good to see you again, Lieutenant. Oh, Jesus. Hank! In my office. Enter and listen in. Explore the office. Oh, we're listening. I need to understand this better. And if I'm going to be Hank's partner, I got to act like it. Let's see what we got here. I've got 10 new cases involving androids on my desk every day. We've always had isolated incidents. Old ladies losing their android maids and that kind of crap. But now we're getting reports of assaults and even homicide like that guy last night. This isn't just CyberLife's problem anymore. It's now a criminal investigation, and we've got to deal with it before the shit hits the fan. I want you to investigate these cases and see if there's any link. Why me? Why do I got to be the one to deal with this shit? I am the least qualified cop in the country to handle this case. I know jack shit about androids, Jeffrey. I can barely change the settings on my own phone. Everybody's overloaded. I think you're perfectly qualified for this type of investigation. Bullshit! The truth is, nobody wants to investigate these fucking androids, and you let me hold in the bag. CyberLife sent over this android to help with the investigation. It's a state-of-the-art prototype. It'll act as your partner. No fucking way. I don't need a partner, and certainly not this plastic prick. Hank, you are seriously starting to piss me off. You are a police lieutenant. You are supposed to do what I say and shut your goddamn mouth. You know what my goddamn mouth has to say to you? Okay. Huh? Okay. I'll pretend like I didn't hear that so I don't have to add any more pages to your disciplinary folder, because it already looks like a fucking novel. This conversation is over. Jeffrey, Jesus Christ, why are you doing this to me? You know how much I hate these fucking things. Why are you doing this to me? Listen, I've had just about enough of your bitch. Either you do your job or you hand in your badge. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got work to do. Ugh. Yeah, I'm just gonna go. Well then, I won't keep you any longer. <laughs> just leave, Connor. Have a nice day. Connor, just leave. Just leave. Get out. <laughs> nope. We're just getting out. There ain't nothing I'm gonna do there that's gonna be good. I just watched two people just escalate each other. There's no, there's no way me saying any of that shit is gonna help and my job. Engage de-escalation protocol. Okay, so, um... <sighs> Hank and the old captain got a little loud there. And I I'd like to use this as an opportunity to say that uh, people get loud when they don't perceive themselves as being heard. It's a very interesting, sim simple brain process where your brain says if this person isn't internalizing and understanding what i'm saying it must just be because i'm not saying it loudly enough maybe they just literally did not hear me so we raise our voice so both of these dudes talking to each other in their own way are not feeling heard and understood by each other so they get louder and it doesn't work because we also are programmed to see people loud and angry as threats. And if you get threatening enough and your sympathetic nervous system fires and your brain gets overloaded and your prefrontal cortex goes offline, you stop being able to hear what the person in front of you is saying. So now not only are you 
threatened, you aren't hearing what the other person has to say, and they're gonna escalate further because they're not perceiving themselves as being heard. And this is how you get people like Hank and the Captain in a shouting match. It's all biology. Now, I also don't think that Hank has the ability to talk to the captain that way unless he's built up enough of a reputation and clout with him to be able to do that. And both of the two, like both of them engaging in this way and getting loud shows that there's some level of care they have about this. Hank has a reputation for being a guy that gets shit done. Yet Hank is very quick to say, I'm the least equipped police officer in Detroit to take this, or in the world to take this, which is a very interesting comment. Because it may very well be that Hank is indulging himself in a imposter syndrome narrative. Maybe all of the things that Hank has accomplished throughout his career, he has accomplished yet done so with his own ability and maybe it's allowed him to not have to do a bunch of work. He just kind of intuitively knows how to do it and he's worried that he's going to get found out, which happens quite frequently for folks who are very high achieving and that he's worried that perhaps this investigation exposes him. There is also something about his response that tells me that he has some personal issue with androids that he has not let on yet to anybody, including Connor. There's a lot going on for this with Hank, and he does have the option to turn his badge in, and he decided not to do that, which also shows that he has an investment in whatever it is that the police department is trying to accomplish with this. So I can only conclude that there's a shitload of cognitive dissonance going on for, for Hank. And so what that means is that I, as an android, in approaching him and in adapting to him in the way that I said I was going to to Amanda... What that means is that I have to be aware that Hank is already experiencing a significant amount of anxiety and is already physiologically overloaded. And so the way that we approach him is going to have to be in the spirit of de-escalation so that we can get more information from him because we're going to have to work with him. And if we have to work with him, we have to find ways in order to build a relationship and trust with him. Sometimes that's going to be telling him what he needs to hear. Sometimes it's going to be being truthful to him and sometimes we may even have to lie to him but we're gonna do what we have to do in order to be amicable with him thank you for all the bits quiet love and thank you for the sub lagard now i don't really care to go see the deviant i don't want to get in trouble it seems to me like that's not a great idea so we're gonna go just we're gonna go talk to hank uh constructive pragmatic or understanding Understanding is not going to work. I think any attempt for Connor to... Any attempt that Connor takes to understand Hank and show empathy, I think is going to contradict what Hank's expectations of an android is, and it's only going to make him more frustrated. We've kind of seen that up until this point. Pragmatic, I don't think is particularly useful either, because I think Hank is smart enough to know what's going on. The only thing that has shown itself to be useful to Hank up until this point is when I have been constructive to have around and I've done something that he perceives as useful, even if he initially kind of has a bleh approach to it. So I'm going to take, I think, a constructive approach. I don't know what that thing that's locked is, but... I think I'm going to take constructive. It's an honor to be working with you, Lieutenant. I'm sure we'll make a great team. Now that we're partners, it would be great to get to know each other better. Is there a desk anywhere I could use? No one's using that one. I'm going to let him be salty. I'm not going to be positive. Like, ser I mean, seriously. I you have to let people f feel how they're feeling. We can work with this. Okay, Hank is not an unreasonable guy from anything I've seen. And if you... I am not going to make 
my anxiety about Hank's distress, Hank's problem. I am not going to passively insinuate to Hank that he needs to get over whatever he is he's experiencing because that's going to make me feel better because that's way too much pressure on him and that's going to take it's going to force him to push me away even further and I would completely understand why he does that. So I need to engage him where he is, which at this point I think means pragmatically and allowing there to be some distance between him, him and I. If I try to close the gap as an android, he's only going to push me away further. I need Hank to be the one that does a little bit of pursuing. So I'm going to stay as pragmatic as possible and not put pressure on him to have to feel better because I think he probably has very good reason to feel like shit and I don't know all the context and it would be ridiculous for me to assume what it is. So we're going to go sit at this desk. And we're just going to let him be grumpy. It doesn't have to affect me. And he was helpful to me when I asked where the desk was. Now, I might be frustrated as a human if I also, in the year, what, 2050 or whatever, was still hunting and pecking for my keyboard? Okay. So, it seems like we could engage him in conversation. I think what we want to do is I want to engage him on something that he probably is going to be happy about regardless and may appreciate that I know about him. Anti-Androids is going to be inflammatory toward him. And honestly, I, as a sports fan, I don't think I want to ask him about basketball. Because if I ask him about basketball and the Pistons just lost, he's going to be pissed off. So let's start with the easy one. Generally, people who have dogs like talking about their dog. Now, the only thing is I'm taking a risk here because all I saw was dog hair on his chair. So let's try dog. You have a dog, right? How do you know that? The dog hair's on your chair. I like dogs. What's your dog's name? What's it to you? Sumo. I call him Sumo. You can get dog owners to lighten up when you get them. <laughs> I mean, it's, come on, it's meaningful, right? Like... I like dogs. Dogs are cool. What's your dog's name? You can't resist talking about your dog, man. So, all right. There we go. Uh, and he likes music. I, he might be surprised to know that I know music. So, let's take a shot and we'll talk music with him now that we've lightened him up a little bit with Sumo. Let's give it a try. Do you listen to Knights of the Black Death? I really like that music. It's full of energy. You listen to heavy metal? Well, I don't really listen to music as such, but I'd like to. <laughs> I don't know that I want to push my luck here. <laughs> yeah, Hank, I love Iron Maiden. Ooh. Okay. All right. Um... Oh, man, asking about Fowler seems like a terrible idea. I'm not asking about basketball or anti-androids. I'm letting it go. So we're, we're not going there. We have to build a relationship with him. Again, we have to check our experience. Do I want to know things about him? Do I want to I want to be buddy-buddy? Sure, but he's not... He's not there yet. We we chip away at it. We we lob into the latent effect that this is going to have. Uh, we're going to try hours here. I was wondering, do you always arrive at the office at this time? I arrive when I arrive. Stop busting my balls, okay? Not, not, but, uh, okay. It makes sense why he would say that because he just got out of a meeting where his boss was busting his balls. But I get a sense that he's, he's self-reflective of this. He probably, there's no way that Hank doesn't know that the way he's presenting is different from what is expected of him. And the point I want to make here is that when people achieve very highly. It, 
creates an external set of expectations. That external set of expectations can feel like it's strangling you. So Hank seems to be very invested in showing people that he is not what they expect him to be. So he shows up to work not wearing a uniform. He shows up very unkempt. He stands up to his boss. These are all things that help him find a sense of autonomy against a system that's probably closer to drones than it is a collective of autonomous individuals. So him presenting in the way he does makes a lot of sense. Him showing up to work whenever he wants. He's leveraging his reputation to be able to exert autonomy on the system. And... But that probably creates dissonance from him, for him because despite the fact that he wants autonomy from those expectations, he's probably proud of those. So he has to negate something that he has built some level of self around and is proud of. I think shown by the fact that he still has some of the, dec the decor from those moments up on his desk. But he's trying to show that he's not who everybody thinks he is. That he's more than that. A tough position to be in, but I respect it. If you have any files on deviance, I'd like to take a look at them. Terminals on your desk. Knock yourself out. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, AL series. Agency name: Detroit, Detroit Police Department. Report date: October fourth. 2038 date of offense October 4th 2038 case reference disappearance victim Gordon Lopez reporting officer ID number 9401 unit number 412 case assigned to Lieutenant Anderson case status open involving Android yes the plaintiff reports that he he left his Android at home as usual when he went to work when he returned the Android was nowhere to be found no trace of a break-in in the apartment the android may have left the home without being ordered to. Okay, so I'm guessing they're hypothesizing deviance as it relates to that. Date of offense, September 14th, 2038. Reported the day after. Case reference, attack. Victim, Charles Bell. Reporting officer, ID number 1379, unit number 566. Signed to Anderson. Open case status and involves an android. The plaintiff claims to have been attacked by a AV500 number 23477821 model Android working as a waiter in the Fast Coney Dogs restaurant chain situated at 842 Chamberlain Avenue. The plaintiff claims the Android lunged at him unexpectedly and attempted to strangle the man before leaving the scene. The Android remains at large. We're seeing two cases in a row of Androids violating some form of expectation that folks have. This one attacked, one ran away. We see fight or flight. We'll keep that in mind. Uh, date of offense, October 22nd, 2038. Reported day after. Case reference attack, victim Sarah Cornwall. Reporting officer, number 4761, unit 714. Case assigned to Anderson, open status involving an android. The plaintiff claims to have been attacked by her android, an AP700 Number 4809138802 model. The android also trashed several rooms in the house before taking flight. Case, okay. Uh, date of offense, October 4th, 2038. Report date, 10 2038 Case reference, disappearance, victim Floyd Mills. Reporting officer, 4703, unit 815. Lieutenant Anderson, case status open involving an android. The plaintiff, a manager of the Eden Club, reported the unexplained disappearance of a sex android model, WR400, number 64179-831. The android disappeared after accompanying a customer to his home and never returned to the club. So we have fight or flight, it seems. We have two androids in this case file that ran away. We have two that attacked. To this point, the emotion that we have heard androids express when they express it, whether the person we interviewed in the detention center or whether it was the android at the very beginning of the game, 
what was expressed was fear, which is a very primitive emotion. Fear is also very useful. It's one of the things that kicks people into fight or flight. So seeing that we have fight or flight in these case files suggests to me that all of these androids might have one thing in common, and that's that they experienced fear for the first time. And then chose how to engage with that fear, either by running away from the stimulus that was that was making it happen, or attacking that stimulus, which is very human-like. That is, in fact, what humans do when they get scared. Or they freeze. But freezing would not be in an android's best interest, so it would make sense why we go fight or flight. Two hundred and forty-three files. First dates back nine months. It all started in Detroit and quickly spread across the country. An AX-400 is reported to have assaulted a man last night. That could be a good starting point for our investigation. shouldn't let your personal situation hamper the investigation, Lieutenant. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. So why don't you just run your program and shut the fuck up? I've been assigned this mission, Lieutenant. I didn't come here to wait until you feel like working. Listen, asshole. If it was up to me, I'd throw the lot of you in a dumpster and set a match to it. So stop pissing me off. But things are gonna get nasty. Lieutenant, uh, sorry to disturb you. I have some information on the AX-400 that attacked the guy last night. It's been seen in the Ravendale district. I'm on it. I think I also need to show Hank that I mean business. And I do think at the end of the day that Hank is going to respect that. Because it seems to me that Hank at any time could say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, he could do that. Um... Uh... So, yeah, he's got to know. He's got to know that I mean business. And what I think what I was, sorry, what I was trying to say is, as a reminder, chat, do not say stuff about things I do or don't do, or things I don't do. Alternative endings, things like that. Um, takes away from discussion. I hate moderating that stuff out. So, uh, we only talk about what did happen, not what didn't happen. Um, Hank could resign at any time and say he doesn't want to do this and walk off the forest. I don't think anybody's forcing him to be there. And at every given point in time, he moves forward and does it. Right? Like this guy gets a lead and he goes, okay, I go into the room. And he's fine with it. So there's something drawing to Hank about this. And so I think him knowing that I'm dedicated to this and willing to work on it. Plus I made an effort to get to know him a little bit. I think he's, I think he's going to be fine. I'm not, I'm not angry that he, you know, grabbed me by the collar and threw me up on the wall. That wasn't about me. That's about all the circumstances that are going on around it. Probably a lot of which I don't know about. So it's very easy for me to depersonalize that. I think if we did personalize that, it wouldn't do us any good. I get it. What's your thoughts on the expression you have to love yourself before you love somebody else in terms of seeking romantic connection? It's true. If you don't see yourself as lovable and you don't build an expectation that people are capable of loving you for who you are and how you show up, anytime somebody shows you that love, you're going to get anxious and you're going to push away. You you need you want to project. 
a bit of lovability, so to speak, toward others. Uh, because if you if you rely on other people to build your own self worth by showing you love, that's unfair. If you can't find reasons to like yourself, if you can't appreciate you, it seems kind of ridiculous to expect other people to do that. All right. Um... Well, I guess we could have explored more of the station, but whatever. All right, we got a lead. Cool. got warm what if certain levels insist on helping you discover said self-worth value even if you tell them not to help uh then those people are violating your boundaries and that's a whole other discussion all right uh, apparently detroit is now located in western washington all right so there were clothes on the back of the car maybe there's something in the trunk here need a tool to force the trunk. Death to Android. Oh, shit. Oh, boy. Okie dokie. Let's, uh, let's get out of here as fast as we possibly can. useful. Got a nice jacket. Looking pretty swanky. Um, cut hair. How the hell do I do that? Oh. Well, that's convenient. Lucky us, I guess. <laughs> uh, Kara, maybe, like, collect that hair so that we can, like, dispose of it. Not just leave it there so that people know that we cut our hair. Accessing AX400 options, select new hair color. Blonde, white, black, or finish. Blonde is the biggest difference, so I think we're going to go blonde. I guess white would be the biggest difference, but we'll go blonde. And apparently we also know we can take this out. How convenient. I'm surprised we're programmed to know we can remove that. Now pick that up and let's put it somewhere where people aren't going to find it, Kara. Or don't. All right, check the neighborhood. What's going on? Uh, 
Police are patrolling the area. What have we here? Cyber Wildlife. First Android Zoo opens. U.S. life expectancy now 91. 0.4% of world population holds 94% of the global wealth. Boy, if that doesn't hit close to home. Cyber Life is set to open the first Android Zoo in Los Angeles, which will exhibit all exotic species to have become extinct within the last 30 years. Loot turtles, polar... Oh, polar bears, that hurts. Mountain gorilla... Jesus. Okay, all right, Ryan. Just read the list. Loot turtles, polar bears, mountain gorillas, African elephants, and several species of tiger will be among the most high-profile attractions. Oof. CyberLife CSR spokeswoman Danielle Carnegie said the zoo, quote, caters to people of all ages, end quote and has a special mission to, quote, educate and inspire the younger generation about the importance of protecting our fragile environment. Yeah, so much for that. Though some environmentalists have claimed the zoo will diminish popular concern for the extinction of real animals, it's difficult not to be enthusiastic about technology being used to recreate vanished species. Is it, though? The animals themselves have yet to be unveiled, but CyberLife promises that they will be more real than the real thing. No doubt, an ideal weekend trip for the family. Ugh, that feels gross. Canada. Canada still Android free zone. Canada, where the air is clean and the welcome is always warm. Discover the landscape, discover the wild, discover Canada. Where are my Canadians at? Despite the United States voting in its Android Act as early as 2028, the Canadian Parliament has yet again pushed back its decision on whether to permit androids in the country. As a result, androids are still not sold in Canada and have no official status in the country. But the androids continuing to fuel unprecedented growth in the U.S. economy, yet contributing to record levels of unemployment, the arguments for and against putting them on sale in Canada rages on. But for the time being, Canada remains an android-free zone. What? So, you know, I hate this, right? Unprecedented growth for the U.S. economy. Which is doing what exactly? Like, who's actually benefiting from all of these Android sales? It's like a handful of people that work for CyberLife. It seems to me that the overarching... Like, effect of this is that the 0.4% are doing fabulous. And the 99.6% the are doing awful. I don't really, I don't know about you, but I don't really find myself cheering for the 0.4%. I don't really find that to be exciting. I don't really give a shit. But the economy, I know, right? God. All right, let's get the hell out of here. If there's if there's police patrolling the area, we need to leave. Alice. Wake up, Alice. And we probably should have warned her we were going to change our appearance. <laughs> No. No, it wasn't a nightmare. How do you feel? I'm cold. What are we gonna do now? That android we saw yesterday? He gave me an address. He said we could get help there. The train passes just on the other side of the road. The station can't be far. You feel okay to walk a little? Let's go then. Before we exit this car, if you want a beautiful example of what assimilation looks like when a person experiences aversive arousal, 
or when something novel happens in the case of a child here. Assimilation is when we try to fit our experience into a pre-existing schema or expectation of things. What we did last night in running away from Todd was a violation of that for Alice. It was an experience that didn't align with what she's learned she is capable of doing relative to Todd. So in order to preserve that cognitive schema that that's not something you can do relative to Todd, Alice's first guess is that it was a nightmare. Because if it was a nightmare, it allows that cognitive schema to remain preserved. It keeps it true. When she learns that it isn't a nightmare, she is forced then to accommodate and change her expectations of what it is that's possible relative to Todd. Now, this makes a lot of sense developmentally from a child because, again, they use inductive reasoning. So she she obviously knows what a nightmare is. So she uses, well, it must be a nightmare, but that nightmare helps her preserve that expectation of Todd. I couldn't have possibly gotten out of here. Kara couldn't possibly be in this car with me, and I'm not, how am I safe? It's a, it's a total violation. So Kara being here to respond to that and to be consistent and reliable to help Alice through that aversive arousal is going to be incredibly meaningful for her. And it's going to help her use some of that brain plasticity she has being as young as she is to continue to build new expanded expectations of the world. A beautiful example right there when she says it's out of knife. Let's go. Get out of here. You're pretty like that. Well, thank you. You really look like a human now. Thank you, Alice. And Alice tries to reassure me. It feels so good. Ah, uh, yes, Shelves, I would. Although I would have woken her before I changed my appearance. All right, we're not going to show her that dead android. We are going to figure out how to get out of here. Escape the district. Leave the parking lot. All right. Here we go. That's all for now. Ready to go. You've got officers sweeping the neighborhood in case anybody saw anything. Okay, well, let me know if they turn anything up. What are you going to do with that? I have no idea. It took the first bus that came along and stayed at the end of the line. Its decision wasn't planned. It was driven by fear. Androids don't feel fear. Deviants do. They get overwhelmed by their emotions and make irrational decisions. All right, well, that still doesn't tell us where it went. It didn't have a plan, and it had nowhere to go. Maybe it didn't go far. Maybe. We gotta move. Let's move. Let's go. Hold R2 to see threats and your destination. All right, so we're going that way. Hide. Yeah, let's go cross that street. Cross the street. There's a cop over there, so we're gonna go to the right. Cop over here, it seems. Oh shit. We're gonna hide again. We changed our appearance. We're good. Stay nice and calm. Alice, just stay with me. We're gonna cross the street. We got other cops. Okie dokie. Nice and easy. We're gonna go left. We got cops coming toward us. Take a umbrella that seems useful. Reported 
Broad Street. Please respond. Over. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. No time to hesitate. Keep going. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Go. Holy shit, we actually made it. Oh my god. Oh, that was so stressful. Focus on what you should. <laughs> Hesitation there doesn't help. I mean, you got to just you got to stay focused. You look for what you got in front of you, right? You hide. I mean, I Jesus. Christ. The umbrella thing was clutch, bro. Us staying calm is what is going to keep Alice calm. We needed to put it in the bank to tell Alice, we're here for you no matter what. Because that gives Alice something to trust in these types of moments. If I instill doubt into Alice's very black and white early development brain, there is a chance that she becomes an unknown variable when we are in stressful situations because she may worry that either I'm going to bail in my own self-interest or that I'm not going to be able to keep her safe or that I'm not invested in keeping her safe. The fact that I have continued to reassure Alice throughout means that I don't even have to necessarily say anything to her. There's more of an opportunity for her to follow along. She becomes less of an unknown variable. So when we're in an intense situation like this, I didn't have to worry about her. It was just follow my lead. Here we go. We're going. Like I took care of her last night. I kept her warm. I've been engaged with her. She looks to me and says, all right, I'm following. So it worked out for us here. We managed to get on the train without catching the... I would hate to know what the alternatives are here. Oh. Wow. It's interesting to me that Alice also seems to be invested in taking care of Kara. I think Alice has some intuition that Kara is also stri uh, stressed out right now. You know, we see her reassure Kara for her appearance. We see her give Kara a hug on the train. Kids are pretty good at recognizing distress, which is all the more reason why if you just consistently try to hide distress, like no matter what from kids, you're not really doing them a favor because kids can usually pick up on the fact that you're stressed out even if you don't show it overtly so if you're show, if you show that you are having some level of emotional experience but that you are also in control for a child it can allow them these little mini ways to take care of you and reciprocate the way in which you take care of them there are too many adults that take that personally and see that as like a shot to their pride when in reality it's just it's allowing somebody who appreciates the care you have for them to reciprocate it and kids do it in a much more simplistic way you know doing the whole like no i'm okay yeah like, that can really punish a child for trying to make that effort. So Kara being willing to accept some of Alice's influence in that way, but also maintaining that leadership role, expressing that she's still worried, that she's afraid we have to act fast, but we're okay. 
throwing in that reassurance alongside with the reality of the situation in a very simple way, super important. It's a great way to help a child get through that type of situation. Sly Fox, thank you so much for the tier one sub. Anonymous, thanks for gifting a tier two sub to Cesarean. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for being here. Right, it also promotes healthy emotional processing for kids. Absolutely. Showing kids that emotions are okay and can be navigated without having to stuff them. You also don't want to force kids into a position where they are solely responsible for your well-being as an adult. Right, you can show them that their reassurances matter and that you appreciate them without putting pressure on them to make you feel better. And oftentimes adults do that passively more than actively. So. Boy, there's a whole other path here. Look at that. Well, I guess that depends on where we would have stopped or stayed. Interesting. All right. Next. Several sources report that CyberLife has provided Detroit police with a prototype detective android. Although police assistant androids have existed for several years now, this would be the first case of an android being authorized to play an active role in criminal investigations. We contacted CyberLife for comment, but no longer. Look for the graffiti. All right. All right, act like a human, Mark. Use the right stick to find the symbol in the graffiti right here. Blue updated. They missed her. Is there some change? What's up, man? I wish I had money. I'd give you some if I did. Alright, so now we have to find what looks like a lion? Tech Addict. Cyberlife's fortune teller computer. Cyberlife develops world's most powerful quantum calculator. Android soldiers, the perfect killing machines. CyberLife has unveiled a new quantum supercomputer capable of exaflops, one billion billion operations per second, the equivalent of several human minds in a single machine. The computer was specifically designed to analyze vast data from various sources and generate predictions. Philip Seymour, CyberLife's director of futurology, is highly confident, quote, we've been testing for a while and the results are going to wow people, end quote. The computer will be used to calculate the probability of, quote, mass extinction events, end quote, such as aggressive alien invasions or global climate disasters like meteors or super viruses. Oof on the last part. The computer can then, quote, help us to anticipate and prepare for such calamities, ensuring humanity is never caught off guard, end quote. Despite doomsday predictions from those fearful that AI is gaining too much influence already, Many experts are hailing this as a quantum leap in applied artificial intelligence. All right. Just because you could doesn't mean you should. Androids! We review the latest models inside. Tech addict. Android astronauts to explore IO. NASA sends Android crew into space. Hackers target solar panels for latest ransom scan. NASA announced the launch of a five Android crew to explore IO, one of Jupiter's satellites. The journey will last three years and is expected to teach us much about the formation of our solar system. Though not the first androids in space, this is the first all-machine crew, proving that androids are sufficiently reliable to be entrusted with an entire mission. Quote, Androids are an extraordinary asset for the conquest of space, end quote, said Michael Shelley, director of NASA. 
Quote, cosmic radiation destroys human DNA. Humans suffer many effects from long-term space travel, while androids are immune to most of these issues, end quote. NASA confirmed no return journey was planned and that the androids would work on Io for several months before being destroyed by the extreme conditions of the planet. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I could get behind android space exploration for sure. Assuming that the androids were sent to it, I guess, but... All right, let's see if we can find the lion. Oh, it won't let me go down the up escalator. So we're seeing little glimpses of Marcus evaluating the world around him in a different way. Right, like normally the Android way is okay, pull up your scanner, blah beep boop bop boop bop. But in this case, Marcus, like on the train, for example, he looks at the androids that are stacked up in the back of the train, seems to have an you know, a look on his face that's a little bit more inquisitive. He he goes down this escalator, he looks at this TV screen, is a little bit more inquisitive about it. I think in line with some of the schema stuff we've been talking about, Marcus is also now discovering that the world may not have been entirely as he was programmed to see it as, and is becoming increasingly increasingly uh, cynical about it or inquisitive about it and trying to make his own determination about what he thinks is fair or not fair or how he feels about it. And so some of this, like, you know, exploration of the environment and looking at it with that peaked interest, I think is a reflection of him trying to develop some of this stuff. Oh, Whoa! Sorry. Excuse me. Jericho is. Space occupied. Welcome to Android Parking. So this seems they may be getting rid of it. I love that the fashion fad is to do this like socks over your jeans thing and that they keep that consistent. All right, so now we got to look around. We got to find like yellow stars and purple stars, the Bronco bar. Man, there's a lot of real dilapidated areas here juxtaposed against the massively advanced tech buildings like CyberLife. Oh, there it is. It's up there. Don't forget these. It's going to be chill, especially if there's going to be police around. I have absolutely no reason to trust police. How did Car Marcus make it out of the situation at Carl's? So Carl got, or uh, Marcus got blamed for Carl's death. Marcus got shot and we woke up in a junkyard. But we didn't lay our hands on Leo. Now we look for robots. And look at that. See another dude just like past the hand. 
if the United States economy is booming, there should not be people sleeping on the streets. Like, this just should not be a thing in Detroit. I don't know how anybody could look at this and say, yeah, man, nah, the, these people just have to make their own cyber life, and then they could enjoy all the riches that folks who are employed by cyber life enjoy. You can't even say go get a job because jobs are being pushed out due to automation and androids. So, like, literally, it seems to me that the only way that you can help these folks out is to tax the shit out of cyber life. Right? And use that to help elevate everybody. I, I, I just don't know how there's another way to look at this. It's, it's mind-blowing to me that me even saying that is relatively controversial in today's world. Absolutely nuts. Uh, robots, where are you? God, this is beautiful. All right, we'll cross here we'll see if we can find him. Ah, Jesus. Hi. see robots. The graffiti's not this way. Agreed, Eldor. Agreed. If I was graffiti on a wall, where would I be?
Oh, I see Ellie's been here. I didn't realize Joel and Ellie came through Detroit. But I guess that would make sense that that's there, given how much rain there has been. Alright, now we look for that face. There it is. Parking Incorporated. Clever name. Weekday rate. First 20 minutes, 3 bucks. Each additional 20 minutes, 2 bucks. Maximum rate. Discount A, 14. Discount B, 10. 8, 6, 10. That seems not too bad for the year 2038. One. We're gonna have to get up there, aren't we? Find a way to reach the roof. Oh, you'd think Joel and Ellie would have left it against this wall after they did the same thing, wouldn't you? Detroit, The Last of Us Dumpster Simulator. Okay, Marcus, I see you. Jesus. Two. Oh, there's the third. That's clever. There it is. Nice sparkle. Use the right stick to select a route. Okie dokie, not doing that one. Wall run. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, why don't we go ahead and execute that? Perfection. Other androids before it on their way to Jericho. Really hope Jericho doesn't suck. Sparkle City. Repair store. Do. I gotta go here. Reconstruct. Dumpster. Jump. 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 No! Can't do that. Would not be solid enough. Alright. Well, then let's see what this one does. Jump. Jump. Pull up. Run. Run up on this ledge. Run all the way across. Jump up onto that thing. Pull yourself up. Jump up directly. Would be too high. Jump over to stairs. Alright. I guess that's what we're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly as I pre-constructed it. Guess what, chat? What Marcus is doing right there 
is an absolutely beautiful example of what we try to teach folks to do with performance. Mental visualization of a task and focusing your energy in what is possible and what you're going to do is a deeply important part of being able to execute something effectively. What you do is you cognitively bias yourself and the motor movements necessary to complete a certain task by making that visualization the thing you lock onto. When you do that, you remove some level of uncertainty variable. And the goal is to visualize a thing so that you build a sense of confidence in your ability to execute that thing. We see this in golf with visualizing a shot. We see this in performance with thinking about like, like acting where you think about what actions you're going to take while you're doing a certain thing or you're saying a certain line the cadence through which you're going to say it. When you think about your performance of an instrument, thinking about the notes that you will play and how you'll play them. If you think too much about what you shouldn't do and what you're trying to avoid, that's actually not helping because it's putting the image of that thing in your brain. So if Marcus was to say something like, I'm going to make sure that I avoid dropping off of that ledge when I grab it, he is putting the image of that into his mind, which is taking away from pulling up on it. Now, do you have to be realistic about the task you're trying to perform? Yes, you want to find an optimal zone there. But this visualization is actually a deeply important exercise and is part of what um, there's some forms of mindfulness that are predicated on this. But when it comes to performance and navigating performance, anxiety and struggles, this is one of the first things we're getting a person to pay attention to. Bet you didn't think you were going to get a tidbit from that, huh? That's what I'm here for. What about performance in people with aphantasia then? What about it? Can you be more specific, Pi Pi? Be out here with aphantasia flailing around the world in the dark. Okay, so well, let's so I guess I see two people mentioning aphantasia. If you do, if you don't or cannot perform the visualization aspect of that activity, what could be done in place? So it's difficult. Um It's going to depend on the severity of the aphantasia. For those who don't know what aphantasia is, it is the it's a it's a struggle or inability to visualize. Um, there's a couple things. I mean, it depends on severity. Like, one thing you can do is you can draw from previous data. So, like a memory of a time when a certain task was performed a certain way. Uh, another thing that you might do is instead of viewing something conceptually you would view something as concretely as possible so you might break it down into a super easy space right so like okay so in order for me to get from this side of the room to the next instead of conceptually instead of conceptualizing that as in the whole we might say like what's the first step well maybe i have to like stand up out of my chair and then we draw upon a memory of a time that you got up from a chair and we potentially use that it may very well be though that that is so severe in a person that asking for those visualizations and symbolism isn't it's just simply not possible and that that in a way presents itself as a disability as it relates to performance because of the inability to see something conceptual But people with aphantasia are perfectly capable of performing things. It may just be that guided visualization a priori is not an aspect of that. Or they have to draw from somewhere else. 
visualization thing is actually really helpful for me since I have the poetry reading next week and I'm anxious about it. Yeah, think about what you will do, not what you shouldn't do. But yeah, we have to, sometimes we have to get into concrete operations as it relates to something like that. So it's a good question. I appreciate the elaboration on that. Aphantasia is not something I work with very often. So, um, you know, my, my discussion on that is relatively limited to, to that. But I'd be curious what techniques that are out there specifically beyond that for people with aphantasia. Oh, shit. Okay, here we go. Well, this place is dreary. of Joel and Ellie going through Detroit. Look at that. Jericho. Reach the boat. So the boat's name is Jericho? Jesus. Well, uh, on second thought, let's not go to Jericho. Uh, it is a silly place. We're going to Jericho. Are you kidding me? All right. Let's figure out how to get up here. <laughs> it's only a model. <laughs> All right. Call to draw. Ah, you ain't going to get one over on me, Jericho. Man, that's a rickety ship. Climbing on oxidized metal just doesn't really sound fun. The one with the force and the force is with me. So this would be a perfect example. We are going to focus on the stability of this bridge and what it's going to take to get across it instead of what just happened with the other bridge. We're going to remove that thought from our mind and we're going to focus on the fact this is a sturdy bridge. I'm walking across this. I will feel the stability in my feet. I will go at a reasonable pace. I will focus on going forward. Just because something like that happened once does not mean it will happen again. And apparently into the water we go. Once again, into the breach, my friends. We seem to have lost our coat. Do 
I got a flashlight built into me? That seems like an oversight from Cyberlife if I don't have a if I don't have a flashlight built into me. Oh! In case of emergency or dark situation where you followed random symbols to Jericho and then a bridge broke and then you jumped off of the taller bridge into the water and you lost your coat and you climbed up on the ladder and you notice that it's really dark in here because you came in here during twilight and you need some a light source because Cyberlife didn't program one into you as an android, break this glass. Or just reach into the box because the glass has long been forgotten. I don't like this. This isn't my favorite thing I've ever experienced. And I would wonder how Marcus is feeling right now because if Marcus is now in touch with emotion, does this does the uncertainty of this moment create anxiety? Is anxiety something he's even in touch with at this point? Hard to know. Seems like an oversight that you would give androids human vision. Because human vision sucks ass in comparison to other animals. Ah, nice. A chair, in case I grow weary on this journey. Man, I'm, pick I'm getting real Dead Space vibes here. Mr. Jericho? Yep, definitely a silly place. Definitely gonna go the... Oh, Jesus. Okie dokie. Well, this is fun. Um... I am one with the force and the force is with me. I'm one with the force and the force is with me. Marcus does not appear to have been startled. How did we not what the hell was that that was in here because whatever it was would have had to open that door right there's no way marcus is hallucinating Jericho in a more structurally sound place with higher structural integrity, Marcus thought, as he raised himself from the floor after hitting a rusted pipe after falling off busted-ass scaffolding. Jesus, what a terrible place to set up shop. Jericho. That was freaking Daniel. From the start of the from the start. Whoa. Was it Daniel or just the same model as him? I don't know if the same models have similar features. Like, I don't think I've ever seen an Android that looks exactly the same as other ones. So, hard to know, I guess. I, although, I don't really know how that Daniel model would have been reconstructed. So, maybe it is a similar model. I don't really know how that works. 
I mean, I gotta believe it's impossible to have an infinite amount of what your Android looks like, so. Holy shit. Those ones in the shop are identical? All right, well, there we go. Gee, 